What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Um, got a bit more of a, uh, <clears throat> what I would call a little more technical in-depth conversation uh, to, to kind of cover for today's stream. So um, there's going to be a decent amount of demonstrations being done here with my G9 Mark II. Um, everything that we're going to be talking about today is relevant for all of the cameras, though. I just happen to be using my G9 Mark II more, a lot more recently. Um, obviously, that's what comes with a new camera announcement. Tend to lean into playing with that camera more than the others. Um, so everything that we're going to talk about, just keep that in mind that what we're going to be talking about and going through and demonstrating will be compatible with the vast majority of the cameras that we have on the market. So uh, try to maybe take a little bit out of that of your mind that, you know, just because it's this one camera doesn't mean that yours won't necessarily be able to do some of the stuff that we're talking about. Um, but yeah, we've got, um, a, a, a kind of a, a, a bit of a refresher that I want to bring up to some, uh, we've talked about this, I think it was at least a year ago, uh, about more creative ways to use the wireless functionality that we have built into our cameras. Uh, and more recently I did talk about and demo the Lumix Sync app, but there's a lot more kind of really cool things that you can do with this that maybe... Uh, if you're someone who works in a studio or you're someone who prefers to not necessarily have to, you know, drag out all your wires or uh, card reader or stuff like that for getting images from your camera to your computer, this can be a pretty cool solution. Um, and especially for someone like myself where I'm doing a lot of work here in my home studio or in my apartment um, in a location where I've got, you know, wireless access. Uh, there's a lot of things that have actually sped up how I work. Especially if I'm, you know, someone who really needs to be able to say, have a client look at JPEG previews very quickly, but still retain all of my raw functionality and, you know, not have to worry about running cables all over the place. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go over that. I'm going to show you how to set the cameras up to do some of this stuff. And then we're also going to be talking about some of the cool raw photo flexibility that you have with our cameras and hopefully provide you all some insight into ways that you can, you know, kind of maybe make your raw experience with the Lumix cameras a little bit more seamless. Um, and that's uh, primarily we're going to be looking at the Adobe suite of software right now, since that has the most uh, kind of full fledged capabilities with our cameras. They're the one company that actually works with us to try to get this stuff in a pretty seamless manner. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to kind of cover through a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, if, if, uh, you are new to these broadcasts, these are weekly live streams that we do every Thursday at 2 PM Eastern time, uh, to really kind of help everybody in the community hopefully learn something about the cameras and give you all an, a, an opportunity to ask us questions, to get answers directly from the source instead of, you know, kind of having to go around in the forums where, let's be honest, about 99% of the people in the forums have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to why something does something in our cameras. That's, that's that level of information that you're gonna get from the brand. Otherwise, it's kind of speculation and going on information that, you know, maybe someone thinks they know or maybe they're close to knowing, but true factual information, that's what we're here to try to provide you. So if you have questions during the stream, tag at Lumix USA or Lumix Cameras, whichever one you want. Um, it just helps me see it on my side so I can get you answers and we can try to get through as many of them as possible. Um... Before I dive into the first demonstration, I want to remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services here in the United States. We have Red and Platinum. I bring this up every single week when we do these streams. Uh, Red is free, so if you've ordered a camera recently, if you've just gotten into the Lumix system, uh, or if you've got a G9 Mark II on pre-order, uh, get yourself ready to uh, register up for the Red tier at least. Uh, the Red tier is free. This gets you your three-year extended warranty on top of the one year that comes with the camera out of the box. So that'll cover any kind of manufacturer defects, stuff like that. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, if you're someone who likes to have that extra level of attention when it comes to service and support side, uh, we do offer the Platinum tier. Uh, this is a paid level service, but the Platinum tier gets you that three-year extended warranty, just like the Red Free tier does. 
but on top of it, you're going to get two day repairs with next day shipping both ways. You get 20% off, off out of warranty repairs. So a dropped lens, broken camera, things like that, things that wouldn't be a manufactured warranty. You're going to get a discount on those repairs. Uh, you also get annual sensor cleanings, EVF, cal uh, EVF cleanings, lens calibrations, firmware updates done by our team. If it's something you don't want to handle yourself. Uh, and then you also get, um, Pretty cool welcome gift uh, with it. Uh, I believe it is still the Peak Design slide uh, slide light strap. Uh, so nice black strap outside of the ones that we all include with the cameras. Uh, and then you're also going to get access to a membership hotline that's open 9 to 5 uh, East Coast time in the U.S. So if you do prefer to speak to someone on the phone instead of going through chat or emails, you have access to that. Uh, so you can take a look at all of these uh, uh, opportunities, these programs available through the QR code on the screen or through the link down in the description. Encourage you to take a look at it. Um, get yourself set up with these programs. Um, so let's see. We've got a, a couple good questions in here so far. So let's um, let's kind of go through them here uh, before we jump in. So uh, Peter asks, uh, hello, Sean. Looking forward to the new G9 Mark II. I have a question. What is the maximum magnification for punch-in when using manual focus assist in photo mode? Um, great question. Uh, G9 Mark II will do up to 20 times. Uh, so it is back to the uh, kind of more traditional that we've done in GH5, the original G9, things like that. Um, so on this, on the new engine that we're using uh, that's derived from the L squared engine, um, this camera does offer that 20 times X, uh, punch in for, uh, manual focus assist. Um, and that will work both for the photo manual focusing, as well as if you're in video and you want to do punch in while recording, you do have that functionality on this camera as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's up to snuff with, or up to par with basically what we've been doing for years. Um, not all of our cameras have that. I know the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X don't have that, um, up to 20 times, um, I'm hoping maybe that can change, um, but the G9 Mark II does have that. So, Let's see here. Uh, DJ says, hey, Sean, sup, what's going on? Uh, can you please confirm subject detection for the G9 Mark II is no longer active above 60 FPS? If so, why? Do you think there's a need for it for nature and sport videography? I personally do. Um, so yeah, when you go into native filming codecs that are above 60 frames per second, uh, so like 4k 120, um, which actually I am going to just double check this, uh, cause I want to make sure I'm giving you all the right information. So we're actually going to take a look. I have my exposure settings all screwed up, so we're not actually going to see anything, um, on the screen right now. Uh, but if I go in and change this to uh, 120 frames per second, again, I just want to make sure I'm giving you all the right information here. Um, I work with these cameras every day, but I can't always know every little piece of information off the top of my head. Um, so right now we're in 4K 120. Yeah, so when you go to 4K 120, um, the subject detection uh, is disabled uh, for now. Um, I don't know if that's something that's going to be added in or if something that can be added in. Uh, subject detection and uh, frame rate, so the readout speed that you're working with, the encoding, all of that kind of stuff, typically do go hand in hand. Um, it requires a lot higher processing power to do all of the subject detection and the, the PAF autofocusing with the hybrid side of the autofocusing that we do as well um, as you start to go faster and faster in frame rate. So at this point, and again, I can't confirm whether or not it's something that can change. I don't know enough of that side of the information, but when you go to 120 frames per second, it is going to be going to your normal uh, focus mode options. So your detection options, uh, animal eye, bird, uh, uh, just general animal, human detection, those things are, are turned off. That being said, um, there is no loss of performance by going to 4k 120 uh, as far as the autofocus speed accuracy things like that go it's more that the uh, the detection side of it isn't there so you have to be maybe a little more uh, on top of where you want your autofocusing system to go uh, and the truth is no matter what any camera that you work with Having great autofocus is, is, a, is a really good thing, and I am super excited that we've upgraded and we have uh, PDAF integrated into our systems now. 
Um, but that is no, uh, the subject detections are also no replacement for good technique and understanding what your intent is behind that. So what I typically advise uh, some people to do is if you know you're going to be filming in things like 4K 120, uh, full HD 240, which switches to push AF, more like a cinema camera does, um, that's where understanding and utilizing your AF points will be a big benefit. So knowing like, hey, I want to be able to say, this is where my region of focus is. This is what I want it to focus on. Use the tools that you have in here, the one area, the zone, things like that. Um, is it maybe perfect? No, but truthfully, no camera is perfect when it comes to that. Um, subject de detection can still be tripped up um, in that kind of thing. So slow motion, you get a little more, you, you have to have a little more control over what it is you're trying to do to make sure that those focus poles are where you want them to go. Uh, and that comes from giving the camera some inputs um, that you don't necessarily have to do in 4K 24, 30, 60, things like that. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, do you think it's uh, there's a need for it in nature and sport? Um, I think a ne it, it's, it's a difference between a need and a want. Um, would I want to see subject detection in 4K 120? Of course, I think all of us would. Do I need it to get the job done and to have a good piece of work? Hell no. Um, this may come as a bit of a surprise for most people, but if you need subject detection algorithms or you need those things um, to be able to get the content out there, um, that's not a fault of the camera. Um, the camera, everything that's in these cameras is a tool to assist you in creating. Um, if, if you need some things like that, like these assist tools, there's nothing wrong with that. What I would emphasize to a lot of people is, is work to not necessarily have to always rely on all of these different tools. Because the fact is, like I said before, even subject detection algorithms, I think um, Emily from Micro Ford Nerds just posted a really good video of her time on Safari. And I took something away from that video as I was watching it where... She pointed out that um, in the comparison she did, and I'm not going to name comparison names. I encourage you to go watch the video um, that she posted. Even a camera that we go up against also has similar, you know, kind of faults in some scenarios where if you are letting the camera pick the subject and you're not giving it any input, there are going to be times where it's not going to actually pick the thing that you want it to. So understanding how to use the system how to use the fallbacks, how to use the the detection areas instead of, or the the um, what I would call region of interest um, tools, the AF modes. Learning how to use those to kind of put the target where you want it and then know that, okay, if I have subject detection options available, they're going to give that extra level of assistance in that particular point. That's where it can be a big benefit for nature and sports, things like that. But... Um, the truth is, is that while, you know, sports, wildlife, all these kinds of, of photo styles have been happening for years without any of these options. So while they're really cool and I love them and I'm going to talk up a lot about, you know, how, how great they can be as assist tools, there is no, um, there is no replacement for experience and going out there and really understanding how your camera works. That's not just about our camera, any camera that you get. Um, if you go to any camera brand across the board, the most important thing is knowing how to use your equipment, knowing where it where it kind of excels, where maybe it sits a little behind where you'd want it to go, and how to make sure that you're utilizing the tools that are available to get you the best shot. So um, that's my opinion on this, um, on kind of how that works. Um, but as far as filming goes, yes, over 60 FPS, no subject detection. Um, when you're in the stills mode, you have subject detection all the way up to 75 FPS for the, um, the burst mode. Um, so there, there, there are options there. It just depends on how you're going to use your camera and how you have it set up for, for your style of shooting. So, um, yeah, let's see here. Uh, another question here. Um, I think it's Avia. So, uh, I bought an S5-2X the other day. Can't figure out why the image in the monitor doesn't change uh, when I change shutter speed or ISO. I'm always, uh, it's always light and the photo becomes dark in M mode. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this this is a bit of a common uh, thing that I hear, uh, especially for new users to the system. Um, people have maybe not used our, our system prior. 
Uh, what you're seeing, um, and if I'm mispronouncing your name, I apologize, um, but it looks like Avia, or Avia. Um, so, what you're seeing is the difference between having constant preview on and off. Um, in our cameras, we have the tool called constant, excuse me, constant preview. Um, and this is found under, I will remember exactly where it is when I land on it. There it is. Um, this is under the setup or the custom menu. So this is the, the gear icon and then under monitor and display for photo. And then there's uh, videos a little different. Um, but what constant preview is set to do is to try to mimic the exposure settings that you're doing um, to, to kind of help you show visually whether or not you're brighter or darker. Um, you have a couple of choices. By default, the camera is set to show um, aperture and shutter speed, but really only work in manual. You have the choice to come in here and change it to say aperture mode will show aperture, manual will show aperture and shutter speed effect, or aperture or the setting where it will only show you the aperture changes between the two. Um, this is kind of a point where I think you have to kind of make a choice as to what you want to be seeing for the exposure shift here. Um, if you let the camera do aperture and shutter speed and you're shooting at something like a one second exposure, the camera's going to simulate a one second exposure for the refresh of the display. So it's gonna look very laggy. Um, you're gonna get your brightness changes, but it's really a preview of what the image is supposed to look like or going to look like when it finally comes out. Um, if you don't wanna use those modes, um, the biggest thing is to, when you're looking at actually working on the camera, is understanding how to utilize your um, exposure meter. So I'm gonna move my camera here so I can point at it. But right here is the exposure meter tool. So if I'm in here and like right now I wanna go into exposure compensation, I can shift the exposure compensation to say I wanna be underexposed by uh, one stop. That number is what's gonna tell you. So if you've not worked with the camera like this before, um, that's gonna give you the good um, kind of explanation and show you whether or not your image is gonna be dark or bright. Um, there are different ways to have the uh, exposure meter set up, but that's pretty much what you wanna look for. Um, otherwise, you can have the screen mimic it. Um, I personally don't, um, but that's because I, I grew up learning on film where you had no uh, exposure preview on the camera for shutter speed, aperture, things like that. If you did, it was a mechanical switch that actually stopped the lens down. So it's kind of just up to you how you want to set it up to work. All right. Um, we're going to hold off on the rest of the questions for right now. Um, let's talk about the wireless functionality. So as I mentioned, there are some pretty cool extended wireless features that we have in our cameras that um, I'm willing to bet the vast majority of you had no idea that we can do this. Um, and it comes down to a maybe a little bit more creative way to do kind of tethered photography, um, but also a really cool way to transfer video files from your camera if that's what you need to do. So we're going to take a look at my uh, G9 Mark II. And as I said, this is something it's I'm just using the G9 Mark II as the demo camera here, but this will work on an S5 Mark II, an S5, an S1, a GH5, GH6, you name it. It works on these cameras. Um, and this feature is when you go into the camera settings and you go into the setup option here. So that's the wrench icon for setup. And you go into the wireless function. So Wi-Fi. This is the alternate way to get into the various Wi-Fi functionality that we have. By default, if you uh, are using the FN button, which is going to be on the main display when you first get the camera... Um, you can jump into Wi-Fi and that's designed to connect right into the Lumix Sync app. That's what it's done by default. Um, and that's because the vast majority of people use Wi-Fi for sending images to your phone, that kind of thing. Um, and that has some uh, big benefits, but it also has a couple little uh, drawbacks by comparison. So if you're someone who's shooting video and you want to transfer the video file to your mobile device, you can do it in 4K. However, you have to be an MP4 to do it. And that's not always ideal for everybody. So what we can do on our cameras is if you come into the, the wireless settings this way and you click on new connection, you get three choices here. You have control with smartphone, which is the Lumix Sync app. That's the, the default way that our Wi-Fi system works that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. 
Then you have send images to PC while recording or send stored images from your camera to your PC. Um, and PC, not just Windows, this works on Mac as well. So in what I'm going to show here is the kind of more tethered way to set this up. And I'm not going to go through the full setup because I have to enter in some information that I can't let you all see me enter. Um, and it's kind of a long way to enter it, so I'm not going to show it to you. But I have some saved here to show you. So what you would do in this case is say you're someone who wants to do tethered photography with your camera, where you want to have your RAW and JPEG images being sent to a computer. Uh, in this case, you're going to select send images to PC while recording. So when I click here, I can then click via network. And I have to interrupt this just because I have my camera connected to Wi-Fi all the time. So what it's doing now is it's, it's looking at all of the Wi-Fi options that I have around me. And I'm going to do from list so I can just find the one that I want. And then we're going to say here, I'm going to connect to my 5G band of my home network that I have here in my home office. So we're going to click into here. Now, since I've already entered a password in, it's already going to enter this password in because it knows the Wi-Fi connection. But what's cool about this is that the next screen that comes up, and I'm going to have to turn away from my main camera to enter this here, is you get a prompt here that says manual input. So for this, I'm going to click manual input. And this is where it gets a little tricky and why I think a lot of people may not realize that we have this. So I have a network attached storage device uh, that I use for this demonstration. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to punch the address in on my home network of that NAS. So in this case, I would do, you know, punch in the whole um, address of it. So uh, bear with me for a second here. Uh, it would help if I started entering it correctly, though. So it takes a little bit of time because it's on the touchscreen. But the nice thing is you only have to do this once. So we're going to set this up and so I punched in uh, an IP address that allocates to a temporary storage device that I use. So once I do that, I just click next. Now, because this is a NAS, it needs a username and a password. So what I would do at this point is I would enter in the username and password for the NAS. I'm not going to do that clearly on stream because one, it's going to take a while and two, I don't want to board you with this. And three, I don't want to give away a password. So the way this works is this is communicating to my NAS. Once you enter the password in, it's going to come up with folders that you've identified as shareable on a network. So. What does this look like once you've entered that in and you've selected, uh, you know, kind of what what you want to have your setup connected to? Well, I can skip right to that part. So I'm going to do select uh, destination from history. So this is something I've connected. And right here, this is where I can see, OK, well, how am I doing this setup? So right here on this first one uh, is to my Internet, to the IP address that I want to send it to. And this is the icon for sending while recording. So sending while shooting. So I'm going to click on this and what it's doing now is it's making that bridge. It's connecting over Wi-Fi. It's using the credentials that I stored in the device, uh, communicating with that uh, temporary NAS that I'm working with. And uh, it's going to prompt once the handshake's finished, it's going to prompt me and say, well, what do you want to be sending over here? So in this case, I can click display to change those settings. So I want to send original files. And as far as file format goes, I can choose to send either JPEG, RAW plus JPEG, or just the RAW files. So for this particular demonstration, I'm going to do RAW plus JPEG because I'm going to show you how I work with this. You don't have to do it this way. Um, in fact, it's much faster to do this with just JPEGs than to do RAW plus JPEGs, especially on the G9 Mark II and newer cameras and even higher res cameras just because of the size of the files. So I've got this set for RAW plus JPEG. And then I'm just going to hit set. So right now, my camera is in a standby mode. So it is waiting for me to start capturing and sending images to my storage device. So, and I never set that uh, particular uh, scene up. So uh, that is a fault on mine. Uh, how am I going to do this? Let's take a look at it in bridge. So. 
I have a folder on uh, this NAS that is accepting these these files. So right now I've got uh, Adobe Bridge opened up here. So we're taking a look at my bridge. This right now, if I go in here, is looking at my network here. So if I click in here, and then if I take a picture on the camera, um, now obviously my exposure's uh, really long on this one. There's a couple cool things that you're going to see happen here. So in the first one here, as I said, we're in network. It's now created a folder that says 2023 10 12 because that's today's date. So it creates it in a date format. But when I go into this folder, it's already got my JPEG image and it is sending the actual uh, raw file over to that folder. So what you see now is that I have the raw image here. I have all of my metadata storage are stored and and fully transferred over here so I now have the ability to fully work with this file on my computer um, now a little bit of a caveat here programs like Lightroom won't let you use an auto import to monitor a particular folder which is why I'm showing this in bridge um, is it the perfect solution for this kind of uh, capture maybe not but it is it is something that I use quite often uh, when I'm doing a lot of studio work here now, I would typically only be using the JPEGs in this capacity because I want a client to see the images that I'm capturing so they can judge like, okay, you know, maybe can you reframe it this way? Um, it's a relatively closer to finish look, you know, look applied to it, especially if I'm shooting in real time LUT. The raw files I keep stored on the memory cards so that when it's done and I've gone through and made my selections. So say someone says, you know, hey, I really like this picture. This is the one I want to work with. I can flag it so that Yep, that's the one I want. And then I can associate the raw and the JPEG image together. I know which ones are, that the client has chosen to work with. But what's nice about this too is that I can be looking in here and go through and see everything about the photo. So metadata that we've normally been kind of following. Uh, and for those that have asked a couple streams ago, this is also a great opportunity to also point out that... Um, the raw still images that you get from the G9 Mark II, um, you can clearly see here, bit depth is 16-bit. Um, these are 16-bit raw files that we are capturing on this camera. So you're going to get a little bit more flexibility with them because of that dynamic range boost system that's working pretty much all the time in the camera. Um, but what's what's even cooler with this is you can see that that was that was not a long um, you know kind of setting to to deal with. That went pretty fast. I was able to get those images transferred over and it, it just worked, you know, as I would expect it, you know, not having to really think too much. And, and honestly, it's about as fast as it would be if I was cable tethering, um, for the most part, not always some cable tethering can be done faster. Um, but if I go back and we take a look at another one, I can take another shot here, change up the exposure a little bit. So now I'm, I'm seeing this, I'm looking and there we go. My JPEG and the RAWs are coming over already. I can quickly preview that JPEG file and say, okay, um, it's there, but I missed focus. I put my focus point in the wrong spot because I'm actually focused around here on the uh, lens instead of where I want it to be focused on. Um, this is one of, again, like I said, this is one of those pieces that I think a lot of times we forget exists within our cameras but this isn't where it stops so it's cool that i've got you know the ability to do raw jpeg just raw just jpeg whatever to transfer over and this is a great way for archiving if you're in a studio you don't really have to think about getting these photos over to uh, a storage device especially because i'm storing them on a nas but the other part about this actually comes down to when you want to send things after you've captured them. So I just terminated the uh, connection here and I'm going to set my camera up in video. Um, I'm going to come in here I'm going to raise my exposure a bit. I'm going to move my focus. We're going to get ourselves just a real simple little clip here. And I'm going to set this camera up into recording uh, one of the higher bit rates that we possibly can. So we're going to go into uh, let's pick 48 frames per second. Let's do codec. Let's do uh, 422 10-bit all I. Uh, let's hit display. And I'm looking at all the options that are available. I'm only recording to an SD card, so I can do 600 megabits per second in 4K48. And camera's going to change over. I just realized I don't know if I've checked to see if 
this switch is going to actually recognize 4K48, so I'm going to change that to uh, something that's maybe a little more no uh, normal for this uh, switch to work with. So we're going to do this in 30p. Um, stupid on my part for not, not double-checking whether or not this uh, switch actually can view these. So, of course, in the live demo, I had to just completely screw up uh, my demonstration here. There we go. That's better. Now we're in 4K 30p. So I've got the thing set up here. I'm going to let me change this to 180 degree. This is not any kind of like really high end piece that, you know, I would really be using to, to do anything with. But so we're going to record a couple seconds here of uh, video footage. While that is recording, um, let's take a look at a couple of the questions here uh, really quick. Uh, and we'll let that go to 15 seconds and then we'll continue. Cool. All right. So that video clip's recorded. Um, before we go too far, a couple other questions that came in. Uh, is the FC series end of life and FZ1000 PDAF would be amazing? Um, as far as I know, the FZ series is not end of life. Um, should still be con continuing. Uh, Peter says, when recording ProRes C4K422 HQ with 50p to the CF Express or SSD with an AFL lens attached and AF turned on, one area with FaceTech GH6 freezes after a few minutes uh, recording time. Um, and AF lens. Uh, I would need a little more information, Peter. Uh, what CF Express or SD are you, uh, SSD are you using? Uh, what lens are you using? Are the firmware, is all the firmware updated? Um, that kind of thing. If you can give me a little more info, I can try to see what I can get you. Uh, DJ says currently L mount lens, uh, roadmap includes a few lenses. Some of them have been there for a while now. Mind throwing us a bone? Uh, nope. Can't, can't throw you a bone. Sorry. <laughs> Even if I did know, y'all know that I can't tell you what's coming in the future. Uh, G9 Mark II seems to lose CAF and frame rates above 120 FPS. Even with GH6 could do AFC up to 240p. Is this because PDAF not working with line skip modes? Uh, if so, can it be fixed via firmware? Um, so 120 frames per second. Yes. AFC works. Um, AFC, as far as I remember, AFC at 240 FPS in the GH6 was also push focus. Um, part of the difference here to remember too, is that the GH6 is the video focused design camera. The G9 Mark II is not, it is a photo first camera that is designed to have good video functionality. Um, so I'll have to dig a little further into that uh, animal, but as far as I remember, I think the GH6 was also push AF for uh, 4K 120. Um, but I could be wrong. It's been a little while since I've shot in high frame rate stuff on the uh, GH6. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, I think the G9 II would be great. Uh, camera to introduce waveform for stills. So do I. I would love to see waveform in stills. Um, I don't know if it's something that our team's working on, but it would be really cool to have it. Uh, on the original G9, when using constant preview, the exposure of the preview changes while focusing. Does the G9 Mark II also adjust the preview while focusing? Um, so you're talking about where it brightens and then darkens um, when you're in single uh, focus or for that initial uh, focus move. Um, that's just what our system does, uh, for the initial acquisition. Um, this is to ensure accuracy. Uh, the more light you can push through the, the lens into the sensor, the brighter the image is to it, the more accurate the focus point can be. And then after that, it is using that information and moving based on those pixels. Um, it's not actually tied to constant preview. That's just because the lens is opening based, uh, independent of what your exposure is. Um, some other brands do this do the same thing, but some other brands hide this, uh, functionality a little bit different. So, um, let's see here. Uh, Dieter says only one, uh, tester demonstrated front or rear subject focus. I haven't heard about it before. Can you elaborate on this? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's near and far focus. I can talk about that in a little bit. Um, Let's see here. Does the G9 Mark II and the S52X support pick bridge? If not, can it be considered for a future firmware update? That's a good question. I don't think we support uh, pick bridge anymore. I don't know many cameras that do, but I also it's not. It, that's more on me because I can't remember the last time I needed something to have pick bridge support. But I can check for you. I can definitely check for you. 
Uh, can you confirm that DR boost is available for stills up to 60 FPS? If not, what's the maximum frame rates for stills with DR boost? Um, I think it's uh, Saravana. Uh, that is something I am still looking into to get the exact specifics of it. But DR boost in the documentation I have states that it works up to 60 frames per second. Um, there is another statement in there about the SH modes, but I have to get confirmation from my engineering team and I haven't just gotten that yet. So I, I will check and try to get you some answers on that. Um, can I enable constant preview when a flash unit is attached, especially, uh, especially in the S5.2, S5.2, uh, S5 or S5.2? Uh, no, constant preview does not work with flash, um, because the communication's not there to say, well, how powerful are you going to be firing this flash? Um, constant preview disables because you're controlling the light independent of what the metering system is doing in the camera, typically. So, okay. Um, back to what we were uh, talking about here. So I recorded a quick clip here um, on my G9 Mark II. I did it in uh, one of the higher bitrate options uh, on this camera. And as I just realized, I don't have the playback. And for some reason, my Blackmagic switch is deciding to not want to play nice. Let's get that back up. Okay. Well, it's back up now. So. I recorded that clip, as you all saw. I can do it again here. Uh, we're going to record about a 10-second, um, you know, kind of option here uh, for the image. And this is recording in a relatively decent bit rate um, for this particular video clip. So I've got this um, right now, just so you all can see it. I'm at 400 megabit per second. I'm in 422, 10-bit, all intra, linear PCM audio. And this video clip is stored on the, the, cam the card for the camera. So say now, okay, I've I've shot this. I want to get this over to the computer, but I don't want to dig through my cables. I don't want to dig through a card reader. I'm kind of, I just want to get it over there relatively quickly um, because this shot's done. What you also have an option to do with the Wi-Fi functionality on our camera is when I go into Wi-Fi function and we start looking at those options, there was a third choice here. Uh, which is that called send images stored in camera to PC. And this is a little misleading because it says only send images, but I'm going to show you what you get in this particular option. Um, that may be a bit of a surprise uh, for some here. Um, and of course, because I uh, had to drop out of the frame rate that I was in, my Blackmagic uh, A10 Mini is not liking when I'm going into menus. So if I scroll down here, You'll see that I have an option here uh, that is show that is with that icon that shows the the square with the out uh, uh, the up arrow. That's saying that I'm sending a stored image to the NAS network that I've connected to before. So right now I've got this set up and it's going to do the same connection method. It's going to reach out with the credentials that I that I applied before. Say hey. Uh, this is where I want these uh, images to go. This is the folder that I'm looking to send these images to. And I can set this to say, okay, yeah, I want to send, you know, originals and full raw, but now I have the option to do select single or select multi. So I'm going to pick select single. These two options here are those video clips that I recorded before. Now, what I can do with this, and you're going to have to bear with me for a second, um, because I'm going to go to... Um, uh, slight little change here. I have to add my audio and stuff to this. Okay, we're back. Now I have audio again. This is what I get for rushing to set this particular part up of the demonstration. So right here, I've got that folder that I'm working with. Um, that I had everything set up on. So now, if I go and we look back at this camera, I'm going to click set. And right here, this is a bit of a misleading part. So I'm sending a video file over. And it says send time 19 minutes to proceed, right? 19 minutes? That's a crazy amount of time. Why would I ever want to spend 19 minutes on a single, you know, 10, 15 second video clip to send over? Well, the reality is, is that it's not going to be. So when I click send, Look at how fast this actually is going. So this is sending that video file that I had already started over to that folder that I have watching. So when I click over onto Photoshop, 
or onto my thing that says Photoshop here, you'll see right now this file is transferring over. Now, what will vary on this particular setup, because the speeds are kind of changing here, is that right now I am using a huge chunk of my network connectivity because I am streaming on it. This can exacerbate some of the, the speed that it takes to send these files over, but this is also a 400 megabit per second image that we are sending over to my NAS. So we're going to let that run for a minute, and then I'll show you what it looks like on the back end side. But um, this is one of what I think is a bit of a, a cooler piece that you can use with the Wi-Fi function in our camera because we can connect over uh, 5 gigahertz to a home network. You get, it, you get the advantage of a little bit faster speeds. And on average, it seems that it's sending it at about like 60 to 70 uh, megabit per second to get those images out. Uh, and it, it makes for some backup as a, a pretty solid option. So if you're someone who's come home from a long day of shooting and you don't really want to sit in front of the computer, you don't want to take the cards out, plug them in, do all that kind of stuff. Some people just like the convenience of not having to deal with that. You can just set it up to do this particular style of transfer. You know that you already want them on a NAS network or something. Go in, select multi, pick all the images that you want to have sent over just click send, leave the camera plugged in, powered over USB, and then go make dinner or have a drink or whatever it is that you do in your off time. Um, it actually has proven to be a pretty quick process for uh, speeding up a lot of, you know, how much time you have to spend waiting for stuff to be offloaded. In the video case, can it be faster just plugging USB in? Sure, it definitely can be. But there are going to be some times where maybe you're working away from where your computer is. Maybe you don't want to be using your your laptop in a studio, but your NAS is on a different part of the, the studio that you're working in. You have that ability to have these images just automatically being sent over. Um, the auto send function works for stills, so for JPEG and RAWs. It does not work for video files. The playback or send what's already on the card works for video stills across the board. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty solid option um, for those that want to have that kind of workflow. And one of those things that, again, I don't really think many people realize we have the capability to do. Um, let's see here. Uh, one of the questions came up. Uh, Peter, bug report for GH6 freezing in C4K 50 FPS. Uh, I put needed info in the comments of this stream. It would be great if you could check on this. Um, yeah, I, I will check on it, uh, Peter and see what we can get. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll kind of dive into it. Uh, and if I can get an update of something, uh, I will leave the comment, uh, under your comment on the video. So while that's, uh, sending over, uh, let's dive in for the last little bit here about, you know, raw stills, uh, flexibility. So Obviously, stills capture with the G9 Mark II is one of the bigger uh, kind of things that we've we've really been talking about with this particular camera. Uh, G9 Mark II designed first and foremost as a stills camera and a video tool from a stills uh, a stills user's perspective. And what I think a lot of people I've gotten a lot of questions that have asked like, "Hey, how does the rolling shutter look while you're capturing stills?" especially if you're going to be doing fast paced motion, things like that. Um, how flexible are the G9 Mark II RAW files when you bring them in to post? Um, even down to the point of, hey, I'm loading my RAW files in, and when I look at them in Photoshop, they're you know underexposed by compared to what they look like in the camera. And these are all kind of relatively common things if you're new to our system, because maybe you've not had the experience of working with these before. So to start with, let's talk about rolling shutter um, effect. So there's been a lot of people out there uh, kind of bringing up the point that we do not use a stacked sensor in the G9 Mark II. Um, there are reasons why we don't use a stacked sensor. Uh, stacked sensors, if you've looked at the progression of, of technology over the years, while stacked sensors can be very fast, you have a negative downside of shadow noise. Um, they produce noisier shadows in general. The ISO performance is not as good on them. So you're giving up your, what I would call you're giving up image quality for readout speed. And in a lot of cases, you need that readout speed for scenes where you actually would prefer to have better dynamic range or better uh, shadow performance, especially if you have to pull those shadows up. 
And I'm using a couple demonstrations here uh, of the motorcycles that I photograph as a bit of a more real world example as to why being able to pull shadows up to three stops actually is something that is going to be a little bit more relevant in the real world. Uh, a lot of people like to, you know, kind of go into the test charts that you see online and then pixel peep across each other and see which one's better. But then you'll also have people that argue like, well, those are charts. You're never going to have to pull, you know, two, three, four stops up in shadows to get a good image. It's not always the case. Um, typically, I would agree that you shouldn't have to do those things, but there are times where you're going to need that flexibility. So this particular shot, I think, is a, a good example. So with the G9 Mark II, um, and as you can tell, Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw did just recently update to support the uh, RW2 files from the G9 Mark II. So if you've got a camera on order and you're an Adobe user, the second these cameras actually start shipping, you will have raw support right out of the gate. You're not going to have to wait for it, which is a really nice, you know, quality of life benefit with a new camera these days. So in this particular shot, this is with the uh, the new 100 to 400. Um, this is a mechanical sh uh, shutter shot. Um, F6.3, so this is wide open in the, the focal range that I'm at. Uh, I believe this was shot at 124 millimeters, the equivalent of 248. And it's, it's fairly backlit. So we see when I zoom in here that you know, there's, there's detail here, but it's darker than I want because there's not really a lot that's kind of separating out the rider from the undercarriage of the bike. You know, I'd like to be able to see maybe a little more detail if there's tread pattern on the tires, that kind of thing, the radiator uh, that's under the cowling and the fairings here. Uh, maybe even just get a little bit more detail in the separation from the helmet and the visor. These are scenes where if you start looking at this, these areas can very easily be three stops, two stops under where the rest of the image kind of really should be. So to start with, on any kind of Adobe software that you're going to work with, the first thing I recommend is you want to make sure that the image that you are looking at in the software matches as close as it can to what you were capturing while you were out in the field. And that starts with coming into the raw default settings. And we've talked about this before. Raw default settings, if you have this set as Adobe, which is the default that Lightroom, Adobe Camera Raw, any of these programs are designed as, is not going to look like how you created it in camera. If you used Vivid, if you used Monochrome, any of those other color profiles, it's going to remove all of that editing and just leave it as Adobe's interpretation of your color. You don't want that. So what I recommend everybody does, one of the first things, is to come in here and change this to camera settings. Doesn't matter if you're using our camera, if you're using any camera, come into Adobe, change this to camera settings. It'll make your raw editing life way better in post. So once uh, all of these images have been imported like that, and what you'll see is that the profile comes up. In this case, I shot these in standard, but say I want to have these in vivid. Cool, I've got my vivid profile. But now, with the G9 Mark II, in this particular case, I've got that flexibility to be able to come in here and actually start lifting my shadows up, seeing how far I want to bring them up, bring a little more, you know, kind of tone into the shadows, get a little more separation. I have more separation between the visor and this. I can start to see the inside of the, the visor with the face. I can see the radiator now from underneath uh, the bike, can see the tread patterns on the tires that, that weren't there before. And it makes, because I'm starting with the camera being set at the, the actual color profile that I shot it with when I created the image, it gives me the, the more accurate uh, representation of those, those colors, that tonality, because it's mapped on what the sensor is designed to create. It's not adding another layer of, in this case, Adobe saying, hey, this is what we believe the color should be because this is what we have tuned basically as a general line for everybody. This makes a big difference for editing. It's a lot faster to work with. Um, I can come in, especially at this point, because in this particular shot, like we said, I know I shot it in standard, which is going to give it a little more washed out look. I know I can come in here, see, okay, you know, everything looks good. The detail looks good. It looks, you know, sharp where I want it. The helmet's in focus. The rider's in focus. And this was using the motorcycle detection. 
So I'm able to come in, make my adjustments. Maybe I want to add a little more contrast to this because I want to really bring that definition out there. But this is 320 ISO. So I don't really have to worry too much about, you know, really lifting shadows. And I basically nearly pinned these shadow uh, setups all the way up. So it really kind of gives a lot of, of flexibility, making sure that you're using those profiles correctly. The other thing here, and this is where I'm going to go to lens corrections. This is, I think, a commonly misunderstood part of the way I think a lot of modern cameras and lenses are interacting with each other. Sorry, I have to make sure I don't want to lose my voice. Um, so modern cameras have lens correction profiles built into the metadata. This is communicated as a package in the raw file to the software. Software then can choose to read that information or not. Um, if you strip all of this information away, uh, there are some lenses that you'll get a wider field of view. However, if you actually start critically looking at the areas that are out of the range for the field of view that the lens is, is designed to operate in, you'll notice a lot of oddities as the, you know, kind of image is being pulled from the far extents of where the lens barrier is. So like I can click here and I can remove the profile and you see that lenses get profiled for things like distortion, barrel distortion, correction, things like that. Um, this is where I, I will divert with some of those people that will make the statement, well, all of that should always be turned off and you should design a lens optically as perfect as you can from day one. Um, while that is incredibly accurate and it's a, it's a fair thing to say, um, I don't think a lot of us want ridiculously expensive and heavy lenses anymore. Uh, everyone wants to have things as small and compact as we possibly can. So you can't have one without the other. So lenses are being designed to take advantage of, of what our optics engineers can do, what their, what software can do to correct for this stuff. But if you're coming from some of the L mount cameras, you look in here, well, for one, this is a Lumix lens. It's the Leica DG 100-400 f4-6.3 to version 2, because this is the new one that's teleconverter compatible. Your make here, in this case, does say Leica. Um, if I were to come in here and then select Panasonic um, as our lenses, which uh, they don't even actually have, um, because we have all of this stuff built in, these... The, the profile lens name doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, that's the brand. Like if you look at using the Sigma 24 to 70 F 2.8 on our S5 Mark II or Mark II X or any of our cameras, it's going to say in here that the make is Panasonic because it's our built in profile for it. Um, the make here, the lens profile is that it's the Leica lens. It's Leica's profile, Leica certifies lenses that are made with their name attached to it. So this is the approved profile and it's pulling from the camera settings. So you can play around with these um, and change them around, especially if you're using something like, um, I talked years ago about this particular lens. Uh, this is a ultra wide um, 11 millimeter uh, fisheye, like rectilinear-ish fisheye. Um, this lens, if I actually take one of the Canon eight millimeter fisheye uh, profiles and put it on this, looks pretty damn good. So that's where you can start playing around with some of that stuff, but just kind of keep that in mind, making sure you're working with these, these tools between your lens correction. I highly recommend always leave them on. Uh, don't turn them off. Uh, some companies will profile the lenses themselves. I think capture one does that. So you can get, or is it capture one? You can get some pretty cool looks uh, with their stuff. They have their own, you know, kind of profiles for it. Um, but Ultimately, those are the two main things that are going to really open up the flexibility you have with the raw files. Um, the second part of this that I wanted to talk about is rolling shutter. Um, actually, before I do that, two more questions just came in. Uh, Darren says, like the motorcycle action shots with blurred spokes and background and feel the speed. Looking forward to receiving uh, my order G9 Mark II. Any new shipment info for North America, West Coast? Uh, yeah, G9 Mark II should be shipping still, um, I think beginning to mid of November. So, uh, only a couple of more weeks away. Um, I don't think there's any issues as far as, uh, transit goes, but yeah, should be pretty good to go. Um, so talking about, uh, fast paced, uh, where, you know, you've got blurred spokes, you've got panning, you know, you're, you're really pushing what an electronic shutter would show you. 
Um, for those that don't know, it, when you're capturing with an electronic shutter, you're scanning the sensor from bottom to top. That means that fast-paced motion, whether the camera's panning or the subject is panning through the frame, can have a skew to it where it'll either start to pitch to the left or pitch to the right depending on the direction that you're moving the camera in. Now our cameras, we have post-processing built in to help correct for some skew. And in the sensor that we're using in the G9 Mark II, it is a ridiculously fast sensor without the negatives that a, a uh, stacked sensor can pose in some cameras. Now these are arguably maybe a little bit of an edge case. This really kind of shows up when you have to pull shadows relatively hard. Um, but what you can see is that this post here, this post leans a little bit to, in this case, the right looking at it it's not a perfectly vertical post here but this is a panning shot using the electronic shutter on the g9 mark ii of this motorcycle passing by and this guy's not going slow um to put it in perspective when he came out of this turn he ended up pulling a wheelie and ripping down the street i do not condone lumix panasonic does not condone unsafe riding on public streets um this just happened to be someone that i captured while i was out there doing a couple of other things but you can see that the, the post is not having the skew that we typically associate with electronic shutter. So if you're someone who's been wondering how is our rolling shutter performance or pointing out how, you know, our competitor has a stacked sensor, therefore it has to be a night and day difference in rolling shutter performance. The reality is it's not. Um, this camera performs equally as good, in my opinion, in real world use cases as you would with a camera running a stacked sensor. So I have a very confident stance to say that looking at, at the images that I've captured with this camera in first hand, using electronic shutter, using mechanical shutter, it's not gonna matter one way or another which one you wanna work with. Um, for this kind of shooting, do I recommend using 60 frames per second? Probably not. Uh, in fact, in 90% of shooting scenarios, would I recommend shooting 60 frames per second? Probably not. Um, who wants to go through 59 images to find that one image when 20 frames per second probably was enough to capture it? Um, it's not a blanket statement. There are some cases, especially wildlife birding photography, where 60 can be the make or break. But you'll find that even when you're shooting with this camera um, and you're using electronic shutter, you still have great flexibility of the file. So I can still come in here. I can still start to bring up my shadows to say, you know, I want to bring in the detail in the guard for the radiator here. I want to get a little more detail on his jacket um, down in the backside here. Now this tire is moving fast enough that, and it's a slick, so you're not going to see any tread there, but start to really kind of bring that information up as opposed to, being really buried down in the shadows. This gives me a lot of that, that control to be able to go right to the edge, um, get it nice and comfortably bright to where I'm happy with it. Um, but what this sensor excels at is how much highlight information you can also pull back. So I can go crazy. Now, I'm not saying I would edit like this normally, but I can go crazy here, pull my highlights all the way back, start to lift my whites up, just to where they start to clip. So I'll bring them back from where they clip. And know that I've got, arguably now, more dynamic range than I would have ever needed to capture for a standard dynamic range image output. But now with the newer addition to Adobe, I also have the ability to go in here, change the HDR settings, and actually start editing it and say, well, I can actually bring my whites up actually a lot brighter start bringing them up even higher to know like, okay, if I'm gonna be exporting this for like an uh, uh, AIVF file um, uh, to be displayed in HDR, I've got way more flexibility. I know where my brightness is gonna be, you know, kind of clipped out. If I turn this off, I can bring this back and you know, I don't really wanna go too far with that. But I have a lot of that flexibility and this camera is producing with the new sensor, with the revision, with the revisions that we made hardware wise, with uh, infinitely better shadow detail than we've had in, in a lot of our previous cameras. And arguably I'd say better than what you're seeing in a lot of the competition within its category 
for especially within a four thirds type sensor. Um, even to when we start going into this, like you have no shadow detail here um, in, in the basic exposure. This is a pretty well underexposed shot because I messed up. But I can come in here and I can say, well, I want to bring this up by two stops. I want to bring my highlights back, bring my whites down a little bit. And then I want to bring my shadows up so I can actually see down into this range. And boom, I have all of that detail that was buried down in the shadowed regions here. It's all still there. And this is at 50 ISO. So this is also down in the low range, which means that this is also not necessarily using the dynamic range boost function because it's out of the range that it's designed to work in. So you've got a, a crazy amount of detail in this camera um, and a lot of control over how much you want to actually really kind of work with these. If I don't want to really pull that much detail out, I can drop this back down, obviously. Um, these aren't necessarily how I would edit these. Like I'd probably only do maybe one and a half over, keep a little bit more of that detail there. And then now, like I said, also working in that HDR range to kind of know, okay, well, if I want to out export out an HDR still, I've got that functionality. Uh, a couple more questions came in here. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, autofocus on S5 II is okay in good light, but in harsh backlit or low light scenarios, the camera struggles a lot, especially with like SL and Sigma lenses. Are you going to address this? Um, I do not share the same experiences that you are having with it. The first thing I would make sure is make sure your Leica SL um, and your Sigma lenses are firmware updated. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest things. Um, the stuff that I shoot, especially with the motorcycles, which is all backlit, whether it's on my S5 Mark II or my G9 Mark II, um, they're harsh lighting conditions, they're backlit, and nails focus all the time. Um, I would be curious what your settings are, um, to kind of maybe help address if it's a settings issue. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't, um, necessarily, I think, realize is that, um, on our cameras, and of course my, uh, ATEM Mini is going to act up again here while I'm trying to show this to you. Um, when you're going to be working with um, our cameras and say uh, setting it up for various different types of photography um, or videography, uh, by default, um, you will see in the menus, you have AF custom settings. By default, this is set to one, um, which is a very basic general autofocusing profile. Um, if you're doing faster motion, if you are tracking subjects uh, that are in, you know, not just kind of a walking pace or general kind of use cases, which can be some running, some, you know, er uh, sporadic movement. This is where you want to come in and actually start learning how to use some of these, the AF uh, settings here. It's the same thing that you'd have to do on our competitors' cameras. By default, all manufacturers try to pick a kind of middle of the road for performance. Um, and that middle of the road tends to get determined on a number of different variables. You know, who's buying the cameras traditionally, uh, what the camera's designed for, that kind of thing, what the system's designed for. Um, but as an example, all the motorcycle shots that I do, it's all with set four, uh, whether it's my S5 Mark II, my Mark II X, or my G9 Mark II, and it nails focus all the time for me. Uh, if I'm going to be photographing like, you know, kind of football, soccer, things like that, that is where I'm going to come in here and I'm going to tweak into like set three, because you'll see that it's changing what sensitivity is, the switching sensitivity, motion, uh, uh, moving subject prediction. These are all things that are change or customizable on your side. If you're going to be in the filming side, it's a little different in the filming side. Uh, this is where AF custom settings has two changes here. So AF speed and AF sensitivity. Um, if I click display here, AF speed uh, is that it's going to, um, it's going to slow, like move the focus a little more uh slow not slowly because that's that's a, a bad way it says gradually here it's gonna try to make it look more like a focus pull than a snap focus like um pdaf can very easily look like 
Um, and you have the control to, to tell it that you actually want it to move faster or slower. But then you also have AF sensitivity. This is where, in some cases, if you may be noticing that, like, hey, it's not changing subjects as fast as I want it to, this is where you would tweak that in the video side. Um, locked on means that it's going to try to stay on that subject that you've got selected a lot harder um, and be less resist, uh, less responsive to something that kind of cuts in front of the frame. Uh, increasing that is going to push it to be a little bit more twitchy so that if something does come in front of the frame, it's going to jump in front of it. So it's, it's going to depend on what your scenario is for filming, right? Not everyone's going to want something that's going to be super reactive to someone, say, walking in front of the frame. For something like this, I want it to stay very locked on. I don't want it to necessarily be like if I, you know, move my hand up in front of me, I don't want it to necessarily jump unless I am putting my hand up to say, hey, I want you to go to my hand, then go back to my face. Um, you have that control in this camera. Um, so I, I encourage you to play around with that because the, you know, backlit, low light, harsh lighting conditions, I am not seeing the same issues with the autofocus. Take that with a grain of salt. I work with the company or I work for the company. I have probably more experience working with our cameras than almost anyone out there. So I know all of the intricacies. It's kind of the epitome of if you know your camera, you know how to make it work when others can't or have struggles with it. Um, but hopefully what I pointed out to you may help you a little bit and maybe kind of refining down that maybe it's just a settings thing. Um, that can help in your particular shooting scenarios. So hopefully that helps. Um, can I change aperture or ISO while filming in 4K 120? Yes, you can. Um, 4K 120 frames per second in all of our, actually in our entire creative video mode, you have full aperture, ISO, shutter speed, I, um, gain if you want to set it to gain. You have all of those controls available to you. You're not locked into anything. Um, and you can change it actively while you're filming. Uh, if you are using ProRes in our cameras, um, ProRes will, in the metadata, tag what the white balance, shutter speed, aperture, and everything is when you initiate the clip. If you change things like white balance or anything like that in uh, after you've started rolling, those won't get written to the metadata. Um, it will, and I think that's fairly common for most things because usually you're not really changing that much once you've started rolling at least from a metadata perspective. Um, but the metadata does carry over on uh, ProRes files uh, that come from the cameras. Um, will you be adding computational modes like neutral density? Also, how is Panasonic Star Focus, uh, which I believe has been included in their cameras for a while? There are two things. These are two things I find useful. Um, so computational um, for things like the built-in neutral density... Um, I don't know if that's something that we're going to add to the cameras. Um, I get the kind of novelty behind it. Um, but it is fairly limiting, um, because the camera's got to be perfectly still. It's, it's, uh, it's making up its own thing and there are artifacts that come from it. Um, the same can be said for high resolution shot mode. So I'm not, I'm not taking a shot at using computational, um, but we are deploying computational stuff. Uh, computational concepts in different areas. So like our live view composite, our high resolution shot mode with motion correction, things like that. Um, knowing that we have a very strong video background, I think logically you're going to see that things like neutral density um, are better handled through actual filters than through a software uh, kind of emulation of it. Um, because at that point really, and things like this, they're not necessarily computational photography. I mean, they, they kind of are, um, it's more that you're taking multiple images and just merging them. Um, similar concept that we do for live view composite and arguably if you threw a neutral density filter on live view composite, you could do the same thing. Um, you know, if you throw like a, a one, like a two stop ND filter on it and then run live view composite for a longer period of time, you could mimic a 10 stop neutral density filter if you wanted. Um, it's just a matter of what pieces you need with it. But, um, it, those are things that as you make these comments in the chat, as you let us know, as you 
you know, kind of point out things that you would like to see in the future. This is what helps us, you know, determine, well, what do we want to try to add next? What could make sense to work with? Where are people seeing that, you know, they want to see a, a cool new feature added in? Um, is it even something that we can do in the cameras? Um, a lot of stuff that uh, can be done in the cameras or things that you want to see done in the cameras are nine out of 10 times easier said than done. Um, because the processors that cameras run are not like what's in our mobile devices. It's not as simple as just doing a quick firmware update and bang, there you go. You've got a new feature. Um, they, a lot of work has to go into it. So if there are going to be things like that updated, it, it takes a little bit longer to do, um, because you have to, the engineers have to evaluate if it's even doable, um, on the processor or if it's something that would require a new processor uh to do stuff like that uh animal says does the g9 mark ii have the hlg photo mode uh no unfortunately not um we don't deploy hlg photo mode uh in the newer cameras anymore um hlg photo required a specific plugin to work with um it was a display ready photo format not a um uh, really designed for editing. I mean, you could edit it, but it wasn't really designed for editing. Um, there were plugins for Photoshop that were created, uh, and it was in a unique um, uh, HDR file format. Uh, and if you look at what HDR still file formats exist right now, it's all over the place. There are HEIF files, which I think are the front runners. Um, Android, iOS, they all use HEIF. Uh, a couple other camera manufacturers are starting to adopt HEIF. But then when you look at, say, like Adobe's most recent uh, releases, they don't support exporting an HEIF for a 10-bit um, basic image file. Uh, they support AIVF uh, or AI, what is it called? Um, it's the uh, AVI uh, version uh, compression here. So... Yeah, they support uh, JPEG XL, AVIF as the two 10-bit options for a still output. Um, now, at least with a uh, AVIF, if you're an iOS user, um, AVIF 10-bit HDR files can be viewed in photos on your phone. Um, but they're a dog to work with elsewhere because in Windows ecosystem, you have to view them in either Chrome or Firefox. Um Photoshop, or at least Lightroom, I think, uh, views them well. Lightroom Mobile can can view uh, those files just fine. And then you have JPEG XL, which is a whole different thing. Um, so yeah, HLG photo mode is no longer uh, something that we have in the cameras. Uh, Exploring says, uh, what is the roadmap for the next, uh, you're saying, GH7? Uh, even if there was a roadmap, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, right now it is the GH6, the G9 uh, Mark II, uh, S5 Mark II, S5 Mark II X. Um, yeah, that's, that's what all the systems are. Um, let's see here. Linus, regarding the autofocus, even in single focus mode on the non-moving subjects, S5 II can pulse with SL lenses and low light. Wedding scenarios and the low light is not even that bad. Again, you're not giving me very clear information as to how else you have the camera set up. Um, single autofocus point does use the, um, the contrast DFD system. Continuous autofocus is what I recommend, especially in wedding scenarios, be in continuous focus. Um, what ISO are you shooting at? Um, what SL lens are you using? Um, if it's an earlier SL lens, it's possible that the motors aren't designed, uh, or there's not a, a full compatibility. There's compatible. There is full compatibility. That's a bit of a, a misspeak there. They are fully compatible, but it is also going to be dependent on the motors that are used in the lenses. Um, we use a lot of linear and some stepping motors now. Um, linear is the one that's going to be faster, more accurate. It's going to respond better. Um, but especially in lower light scenarios, use AFC, um, autofocus single, uh, I think from day one, we've, we've kind of pointed this out. There is, it is a phase hybrid system. Single AF, uh, typically is handled in the DFD contrast side because it is more accurate. Uh, and it, it's also a lot faster when there's good light, lower light scenarios. Yes. 
it's not as fast as accurate, but that's where I would highly recommend switch it over to continuous autofocus because there you're using the full blown PDAF system. Um, and you'll see, you should see a night and day difference. Um, that may be what the challenge is there, but ultimately I'd also, um, confirm what ISO value you're at. Um, little known fact, all camera manufacturers out there, when you go up to some of those ridiculously high ISO values, you are actually reverting back to contrast autofocus. Um, when you go into ultra low light scenarios, which like you're saying, I've shot weddings before. I, I know what you mean by it's not really like a horrible low light scenario. Um, but ultra low light scenarios. Um, and I think camera conspiracies did a good video on this where he walks into the bathroom and shows you, um, all cameras in ultra low light, when you go past what their, the PDAF EV ratings values are, they all convert back to contrast. Um, and when you go up to really high, high ISOs, they all revert to contrast typically as well. So, um, I don't know what the figures are off the top of my head, so I can't share those at the moment, but I can look into it. Um, well, cool. We're at about 2.15 here in uh, Central Time Zone. Um, awesome. I want to uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I want to thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in. Um, I love the conversations that you all have. I love the questions. Um, if there are things that I can't answer, obviously, I apologize. But, you know, if you've been around on these streams long enough, you know that there are certain things that I can't answer because it involves future planning, things like that. And I really like keeping my job. Um, and I think a lot of you like having me here doing this, at least from what I've been told. Um, so yeah, with that, um, I want to remind everybody, um, that, uh, actually not remind everybody, I should probably let everybody know next week's, uh, broadcast is going to be a pre-recorded stream again. Um, I unfortunately will be, uh, on a flight, actually, it's probably going to be a pre-recorded stream. I may be back in time to do the live stream next Thursday. I'm not hundred percent sure as long as my flight home does not get delayed, um, but yeah, we are wrapping up some pretty cool production on the shutter showdown activities that, um, if you've, uh, been following us over on YouTube or here on YouTube or some of the other platforms, uh, shutter showdowns, uh, short series that we've got coming out that I really think a lot of people are going to get a kick out of. Uh, we're wrapping up some of the final little pieces of that. So I got to go, uh, help with that production. Um, outside of that, uh, next week's stream, we'll be continuing on, on the topics that, uh, a lot of you have been asking us for. Uh, we will be trying to get a couple more, uh, people in here to do, uh, some interviews. Um, so be sure to like, subscribe, uh, you know, tune in on all of our different platforms with this. Uh, and I believe, believe that is it. Other than that, Thanks everybody again. Love all the comments. Love the feedback. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered, drop it in the comments after this video. If you have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, drop them in the comments after the video. Uh, if you know someone who may uh, find interest in what we talked about today, uh, let them know about the video. Share it. Let other people know. Um, it helps us grow this channel. Outside of that, um, thanks again everybody. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. I hope you have an awesome weekend. Uh, get out there, create some cool stuff, photo videos, and uh, we look forward to seeing them over on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, whatever platform you share them on. All right, I'm ending it now. Later. <laughs>